Pergamon Press, and we're thrilled to be co-sponsoring the Grace and Pale Poetry Series, and we're glad to be a part of that today. Um, oh, a reminder: we uh, we will have uh, Kevin Pilkington out in the in the lobby and signing his books after this. So, after this. please do do uh, say hello to him out there. Well, Linda Simone has described Kevin Pilkington as a poet who sees the world through many hued glasses, sometimes at an odd tilt, and employs strong verbs that once worked as nouns to speak his mind. A member of Sarah Lawrence College's writing faculty and a graduate workshop instructor at Manhattanville College, Kevin is the author of six poetry collections. His collection, Spare Change, was the La Jolla Poets Press National Book Award winner, and his chapbook, won the Lad Poetry Prize. Ready to Eat the Sky was published by River City Publishing as part of their new poetry series. And for the finalists for an independent publisher's book award. His In the Eyes of a Dog collection was recently published by New York Quarterly Books. Eric Pure described Kevin's most recent collection published in 2011 thus. Simple, direct, and honest with striking images and evocative wordplay. The Unemployed Man Who Became a Tree is a beautiful, imaginative book. His poetry has appeared in many anthologies and has been nominated for four push cards. His poems and reviews have appeared in numerous magazines as well, including Poetry, Bottle Shares, <coughs> Iowa Review, Boston Review, Columbia, Greensboro Review, North American Review, Gulf Coast, and Valparaiso. And it's a pleasure to have Kevin himself appear with us today. Welcome to the 8th Annual Burlington Book Festival. Kevin Bill. Thank Thank uh, Partridge for that introduction. Um, it's uh, really wonderful to be reading in this uh, book festival in the Grace Pally Poetry Series. Uh, I actually knew Grace a little bit. She um, uh, taught at Sarah Lawrence for many years. And she uh, actually retired a few years before I started there. Um, but she always came back for various uh, readings and, and, and lectures and, and commencement addresses. And we, we loved having her. Um, and Grace really was, you know, who you see is what you get, you know, uh, up front, uh, no masks, as Yates would say. Um, but my, my favorite story is uh, a, a former colleague who retired. So during the 60s, Grace would go down during the Vietnam uh, War era and, and, and demonstrate in the city. And of course, many times she would be uh, uh, incarcerated. They would lock her up uh, and, and end up spending the night in the woman's house of detention in Greenwich Village, which is no longer there. Uh, I think there's a garden there now. Um, but the president of the college would have somebody on standby and send that person down to get Grace out of jail, bail her out, so she could get back to class and teach. So, so that was a great story. I love that story. Um, I'm going to, um, I have been reading a, a lot of poems from my last collection, The Unemployed Man Who Became a Tree. But uh, I have a new and selected book coming out uh, later next year, so I thought I'd read a little bit from that book. So a little bit of everything over the past couple of, of books, past couple of years. Um, uh, but this first uh, poem is from The Unemployed Man Who Became a Tree. It's the title cut. And um, an editor uh, from a, a lit magazine said he was putting out a, a, uh, an issue that had to do with uh, poets who had unusual jobs over the years. And, and, and he said, we would love to have, we would love to have your, your poem. It would be perfect for our, our issue. Uh, love your stuff. So I mean, how could you turn that down? And so I, I thought about it, and I realized that I didn't have any uh, unusual jobs over the years. I had unusual students. I taught most of my adult life. But so I came up with this poem and I sent it in, and it was the quickest rejection I ever got. He sent it right back. He said, "This isn't what I had in mind at all." Uh, but I ended up liking the poem so much that, uh, and it, it ended up in a magazine. So there's a happy ending there. But um, it became the title of the collection, and, and and in the poem there's a reference to Charlie Parker, and his nickname was Bird, and apparently he would go. What influenced his, his uh, unique playing style was he'd go in the backyard and actually listen to birds. And if you ever see those old kinescopes, black and white kinescopes, you'll see his fingers moving up and down like a flock of birds. So, 
And so it's called The Unemployed Man Who Became a Tree. I lost my last job and spent the rest of the summer working on a tan. With little money left, I searched the wanted until coming across an opening for a tree. The spot was just a few blocks away, near the path that runs along the river. I hurried over to the square patch of dirt and the concrete where the city cut the last tree down, then stood on it, looked around, liked the area, and decided to take the position. Within minutes, my legs went stiff as my feet began to root the soil. My arms branched out, skin became bark. The paper didn't say what kind of tree was needed, although my limbs looked maple. From the waist down, I was all oak. By evening, I was just about done, even began thinking like wood. How to bud April green enough to get spring going early this year. The only bird I ever cared about was Charlie Parker. Now I wanted a flock to rest on my limbs, build a nest on the highest branch that sprouted from my ear, a place to call home, a place safe from cats. By evening, the fog that crawled in on its knees was gone, and there I was alone, holding up the moon in my branch, shaped like a right hand for the entire city to see, smiling. Like, like all poets, you know, I worry about uh, every word, every space, every image, every comma. Uh, and I think the poet Robert Francis said, he had a great day writing once. He, had, he got two lines done. Um, so, but every once in a while, the gods give you an image or a line and, and as a gift. And um, I got this wonderful image from the gods. And the image is ready to eat the sky. And, and I love the image quite a bit. But th that was the good news. The bad news was I had to write an entire poem to get to it, and that was going to be the last line. I had to make it fit into the poem. So this is where you want to be. You wake early again. Get out of bed, walk over to the window and look down at the street to see if anything has changed, and of course it never does. At first you think the blanket in the vacant lot near the corner is new until a gust of wind blows into the air and shreds it into a flock of pigeons. And if all the new clubs make sure the city never sleeps uptown the way the papers claim, then people under cardboard in alleys and in front of doorways down here is how it finds a way to nap. The steeple on St. Paul's a few blocks away is a spike that nails Christ into the sky if you can't find anything on the street to believe in. But it does nothing for the bent trash cans standing along the curb like arthritic old men who know the real purpose of any life is found in what everyone else throws away. A woman coming out of a grocery store on the corner of 4th in a short skirt and heels does a better job stopping traffic than the red light hanging from a wire I would rather swing back and forth like Count Basie in the wind rather than stop every car it should. When you hear the woman you admit you love start breakfast, cracking open an egg like the dawn, its yolk a tiny, perfect sun, you are convinced this is where you want to be, walking towards her, hungry and ready to eat the sky. My niece, like all little kids, around the ages of three and four, uh, uh, you know, everything was wonderful. The world was new. Everything was great. And the language was even newer. And she would put, like, interesting spins on, on words, the familiar words that we all know, and phrases. Uh, for instance, uh, she once said, uh, when I, back when I used to smoke, she saw me smoking, she stopped her foot and said, don't you know that if you, if you smoke, you're going to go to Kansas and die? <laughs> and that scared the hell out of me. I didn't want to go to Kansas. Uh, so it was, it was great. She loved language, she loved stories. She, now she, she's in college now and she writes and, she, and, and, and she's a wonderful writer and poet. Um, but I, I would go over to her house and she'd sit on my lap and I'd tell her stories. And that was great. That, that went on for a while. And then this other problem came up that I didn't expect would, would, would happen for at least another few years. And that's what this poem is about. It's called Boys Can't Be Trusted. My niece likes to sit on my lap every time I visit. When she wants me to make up a story rather than read it from a book, she'll say, read me a story from your mouth. I've been quite prolific with titles like The Fur Tree That Wore Imitation Fur, The Turtle Who Made calls on his shell phone, 
and the poet trees in the forest. My niece likes to hear about boys who get in trouble since girls are smarter and nicer. So I decided to add some disguised autobiographical sketches. The two favorites from the boy series are the dumb boy in math class and the boy who could balance a basketball on his finger but couldn't balance his checkbook. So I was surprised when she told me about the boys in her preschool class. Michael Ciccatelli is very smart and knows everything about dinosaurs. Paulie Floater has been showing her tricks on his yo-yo that only he can do. And Walt Wheeler's father is Walt Disney. How could I tell her this is how it starts? These little creeps can't even spell their names, but already have uh, lines to get over on a pretty girl. Next, they'll be ringing her doorbell, dressed in expensive clothes, their European sports cars with names nobody can pronounce, sparking in her driveway and jewelry they'll want to give her, then kiss across her neck. I couldn't let these guys get away with it, and would later have to speak to her father. But until then, and since my niece was curled up on my lap, I began a new story called, Why Boys Who Like Dinosaurs Yo-Yo Tricks and Say Their Fathers Are Famous Are Liars and Can't Be Trusted. Uh, my, my dad was born in Killandima, Galway, Ireland. And this is about, basically about his, his, his wake, his, his funeral. But he'd want me to tell you about, about uh, this little incident um, before I read it. Uh, this is from my first book, Spare Change. Uh, I grew up in, a, in an Irish household, Irish-American household, uh, which meant that you know, we thought the Holy Land referred to Dublin until we were about 15. And um, my dad took me to an Irish wake, and I don't know if you've ever been to one. But, you know, the liquor flows, and after a while everybody's happy and thrilled. And I remember probably standing there as, a, as an 11-year-old or 12-year-old and just amazed by this. My dad walked over to me and said, you know, I looked at, it, at, at everybody and said, remember, Kev, the reason God created liquor is so the Irish wouldn't take over the world. This is my father's hands. When I was six, wind kept blowing my hats off until my father placed his hands gently on my head whenever we crossed the street. The perfect fit of fingers and palm, a hat no Gus could take from me. And I remember him placing his hands on my shoulders the first time he showed me a map of Ireland. He explained how he left there when he was my age, then pointed to the dots the same size as the ones on my hands that were named after cities. It was easy to see even then, if he stayed, he became too large a man to fit in a country so small. When we walked into the funeral home last week to view my father for the first time, my mother hurried over to him, fell on her knees, buried her head against the coffin, and began sobbing. As I walked over to place my arms on her and around her, I looked into the casket and knew there must have been a mistake. It wasn't him. This man's mouth drooped like my dad's never had, and he was pale, almost white. My father, who worked outside, was the color of weather. Just before I leaned over to tell my mother, Dad wasn't gone after all, I noticed his hands. At first, I wasn't quite sure if they belonged to my dad, until I looked closer and saw Dublin on his thumb. I knew then there was no mistake. All I could do was kneel down next to my mother, close my eyes, and listen to her sob. There's a liquor motif. This next one has to do with liquor as well. It's called in a bar on 2nd Avenue. And the only thing you have to know about this particular poem is that the speaker gets a little more, a bit more inebriated as the poem progresses. In a bar on 2nd. You sit in the bar on 2nd Avenue with the woman you want, but notice the distance in her eyes has the extra mile that even another drink could never help you reach. As she eats slowly down a cigarette towards her fingers the way you would. She'll just take you home later and let you burn. She stares at the band and the guitar player who heats the blues with his riffs. When the drummer slides his brushes across the snare, it reminds you how you slid through the last few years. How mo most nights weren't worth the dark it took to get through them. And each time dawn was the prize, you turned it down, then held on to your sweat instead. Now, you want to tell this woman that life is shorter than her skirt, without its style. As soon as the next song ends, you want to begin over 
with her. Learn to love the way she tilts her head every time she whispers. And be gentle with her body that up to now has only kept you thirsty. When two guys in the next room get louder, you consider taking them up and prove your strength. But no, the only thing you want to live tonight are her legs. After another, make you realize that even if she doesn't need you, there's a lot to be thankful for. The way your eyes have begun to blur, and how the horn player, with the good lip, the last song of the night, blows your past clean. Um, I was in, uh, as I said, I work at, at Sarah Lawrence College in Westchester, New York, which is about 40 minutes outside of New York City. And last year, I was up um, driving shotgun, getting a ride to, uh, to work. And it had rained up for a few days in April. And on the side of the highway, you had to put this temporary sign up, and it said, caution, depressed drain pipes ahead. Um, so I thought, you know, I'm sure you, you thought the same thing. Why didn't the county, you know, pay the taxes and put it to good use and get them into the group therapy, right? They'd, they'd be happy, we'd be safer, everybody would win. It doesn't have too much to do with this poem other than the fact that uh, it's called therapy. Once, it was easy to love an entire country rather than just one person. Then he met a girl who chewed gum that snapped in her mouth like tiny firecrackers. You say you spent with her was the 4th of July. And the first night you slept together was the only time in your life you felt patriotic. You spent too much time thinking about the past, though sometimes it can't be helped. When the weather report said the temperature would reach the 60s over the next few days, it made you take out your old beetle album and play them all week. Therapy is helping you deal more and accept what's going on around you now. So when you see another magazine with a member of the royal family on the cover and get disgusted with all the money you wasted on them, you have to remind yourself how you always wanted to be the next king of swing. You are also learning to make peace with the fact that when the doorbell rings, the poodle in the next apartment will always bark in French instead of English. Now the car horns in heavy traffic along First Avenue and Rush Hour are beginning to sound more and more like Gershwin every day. I have uh, one, since I am in Vermont, I have one Vermont poem. Uh, I've published my first collection. I've never read it, so I'm trying not to trip over it. Uh, like my brother was just telling Parchment that like my brother was a place in Woodstock, Vermont. It's called Holding a Form in Your Hands. My brother invited me and my parents to his place in Vermont. I was up early to see how a flock of geese pulled in the dawn, rubbed it against mountain peaks until it sparked the sky and burned away in the dark. By seven, the fires we started crackled the house warm. My mother's at the stove, scrambling the sun out for good. My dad is outside in his favorite sweater, with the holes in the elbows. A moth left, he ever got full on, on elbows. He's walking out to the pond. He wants to stop front of the house. At first he thought pipe, but now it talks perch. Tom, who jogs a few miles every morning, is already back from five. For jokes, he is still, he is still not as strong as the coffee I perked. He had to cut it weaker with the cream he bought from a farm in Manchester, the same one we spotted from the side of a mountain last year where we hiked up. I remember now looking down at it in the valley, where I leaned over to pick up the entire farm in my hand. For a few moments, the cows grazed with my thumb. I was reading a, uh, an essay uh, by William James, Henry Brothers, a psychologist, philosopher. And he, and he said a lot of incredible things. But this one phrase that came across was uh, uh, the concept of the soul is man wanting more. Uh, so I think the speaker of this particular poem uh, realized that maybe, you know, the soul is a metaphor. And the way you, or the way sometimes we might mourn is that you have to your health. Uh, so this is sort of, sort of a strange take on the concept of the soul and the afterlife. <coughs> My parents were right about an afterlife. Even though they died six years ago, 
I talk to them every day. Tonight, they are in the living room while I'm in bed with a woman I met in a bar. Waiting patiently for me, my mom is ironing the pants I flung on the couch, making sure the creases in them are sharp enough to cut into the apple pie she made me as a kid. My dad sits with the newspaper in his favorite chair, what I took from their house after it was sold. He likes to open the obituaries these days, believe that he's not in them anymore. The woman I'm sweating over was the hottest thing I ever saw just a few drinks ago, and still is, as long as I keep my eyes closed. Her legs keep slapping against my thigh, so I stay on top of her. Afraid if I get off, she'll begin to fly and bang her head against the wall. If I knew her name, I'd use it. Tell her things like, it's almost time to stop. In a couple of minutes, we give up instead. Neither of us would come, and it was clear she's going to go. I asked her to. She gets up, searches for her clothes, scattered around the floor as if they exploded. The sweat on her body could be greased when she slides into things. Then most of the mirror fluff up her hair with her fingertips. No matter how hard she tries, still hangs like the curtains of the meaning to my the bedroom window. I don't even try to explain why I need her to leave, that my parents could never be in the next room after the way the can should be, or how I have so much to discuss with them now that I found out what it really means to be dead. Like cats. Anybody? Sure. Yeah, I can't stand them. <laughs> uh, well, we, did have, we did have a, a, a cat. It's really interesting. Um, as I said before, my, my dad was born in Ireland. We used, we used to say that he had this, this, this leprechaun syndrome. He wanted everything to be big. You know, like anything small. His kids or, or his animals, his cats, you know. My, my brothers are all over six feet, so he was willing to go, you know, over, give me for my short tummies. Uh, but he, um, every time he got an, an animal, he would like make these like concoctions of food that were really disgusting and smelled awful. <laughs> You make me and say, well, this is going to make you know, Rocky or, or Shepard huge. This is going to make, you know, uh, our only dog, a, 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 you know, massive. So um, he came home with a cat one time, and same thing. You know, he made these great, great cops with his stump. And uh, he'd say, you know, the, the cat's going to be massive. He's going to be the biggest cat on the block. And, um, so, I mean, that worked out fine for about two weeks. The cat would eat the food, put it out in the, you know, in the backyard, the cat would eat the food. And uh, my dad would watch his growth. But then he stopped, he stopped eating the food. My, my dad was very upset. Um, but then the cat kept growing. He didn't quite get it. The cat's not eating, but how can he grow that much? How can he get muscular? So one day we were looking out the, uh, out the bedroom window, and we saw him in the backyard. He was frozen stiff. And, um, He's like that for about 20 minutes. Then he passed on a bird and it. So he would eat birds. And, and then we also had like, these fat, happy squirrels in the backyard. We had a big backyard with a lot of trees. And I think, you know, our cat, his name was left. He would look around and say, it's time to thin up the population. <laughs> so um, he, would, he would kill these squirrels and remove the head and leave the body by the back door as an offering. Or you know, maybe it was something that we need more protein in our diet. But, but he would leave these for them. I remember when my mom would come screaming at all. Uh, we counted up about 75 squirrels. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then later on, there, there was a, this, this stinky death case. We had this cat that lived down the street and the stinky. We had gone away for about a week and he came back and the stinky was killed. And, and the stinky owner said, you know, our, our cat was killed. killed, killed. That was never proven, of course, but we were accused of that. And, um, and then, I don't know if you've ever heard cat fights, but they're actually quite frightening. Like, he's screeching at night, and we would hear these fights all the time. And then, Lefty would come home, and, uh, you know, he had his, his, his ear would be bent over from the fight. And then he'd have a gash in his forehead, and it never really healed because he was going to put up a fight. He had this permanent gash in, in, in his forehead, and he'd bend over the ear. He looked like Mike Tyson having 15 rounds or something. So, uh, but this is about, it's longer than the poem, uh, the last poem, and, uh, but it's about, it's about our cat Lefty, and it's called a cat that could fly. 
The cat we had as kids never ate the food we gave him. Instead, he hunted the backyard and would have me on sparrow and robins. When he sm spotted small birds, he'd freeze, even in August, turn concrete, stone twitch more. Then he had pounce, his jaws filled with thrashing wings, as if his mouth was trying to fly away from his head. The day he killed a squirrel and left the body like a dead Cossack at our back doorstep, our mother's screaming made trees rustle. At night in winter, we heard him fight other cats. In summer, it sounded like tires spinning on ice. The gash in his forehead never healed. His ears were shaped like figs. The day my brothers and I found him on the side of the road where he was hit by a car or a truck, we covered him with leaves and sticks, his eyes staring like a dime at the bottom of my pocket. When our four-year-old sister asked why he didn't come home anymore, we told her, he ate so many birds, he just flew away. For months, three times she went out to play, the first stopped by the door, she held her eyes with her hands, and looked up at the sky. Thanks so much. <laughs>